Hey, Eisen Chandler, my friends, and welcome to the I Give a Damn podcast. Today, my guest is none other than Dr. Vito Mena. Vito is a man of many skills and talents, but is probably best well known for his passions and expertise in that of sports vision, nutrition, and personal finance. He serves with the AOA's Sports and Performance Vision Committee, as well as having a 214 Life and Variable Annuity License, along with a Series 6 and Series 63 investment license in over 15 states, which is a very unique and powerful skill set for optometry. In today's episode, we uncover some of Vito's own personal journey and how he discovered his passions. He shares some of his tips on finding professional success and leadership, as well as diving a bit deeper into personal finance, where we discuss the importance of minimizing debt and how to invest your time, money, and resources into breaking those golden handcuffs and achieving personal financial freedom. So please hit that subscribe and follow button. And here we go with Dr. Vito. Mena. Well, Vito, this is uh, again a huge honor for me. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. Uh, again, you and I have been friends, I think at least maybe two years. I saw you first presenting some ECE, and uh, then we ended up just meeting through acquaintances. And for anybody who hasn't uh, met Vito at, at Academy or some sort of like one of our events for optometry, uh, you, you're not you're hard to miss. I mean, between just your style of your clothing, which uh, I know before we started recording, I just I, I had to compliment you on that. I always pay attention and appreciate people who have just got a good, colorful style, stand out, not afraid to be themselves. And then you're also that guy with the camera. You know, I'm not just myself being into cameras, but you. Chances are, if you're listening to this, if you haven't met Vito yourself, uh, expect to get a photo with him at some point. <laughs> so, um, but without further ado, Vito, um, welcome to the again to the channel, and it's awesome to have you here. Yeah, thanks so much. I feel privileged to hear you and me asking for me to come on and speak. So, thank you for that. No, this is great. Uh, the, I would love to just first off hand it off to you, just for our listeners. Tell us a little bit more about yourself how you got into optometry, uh, and just kind of the journey, where you are now, how did you get there? I'd love to, let's, let's hear about it. Yeah, sure. So in undergrad, or before undergrad, I went in high school, uh, I was always into sports, and I love sports, and I was trying to figure out where do I want to go in the sports field? Is it sports medicine? Do I want to be athletic trainer? Do I actually want to be in a sport? Mm -hmm. um, and I knew I wasn't at that level. I knew I wasn't that D1 quality of a player. I was a good player, a scrappy player, but I wasn't D1 quality. And so I was trying to figure out where do I want to go? And um, the eyes lead the body, and so I thought about optometry. And so in our senior year, we had a career connections course. Mm -hmm. And during that time, you just you know, answer some questions, and at the end of it, it populated that I should, e I should either be a photographer or I should be an optometrist because, again, the eyes like a camera. Yeah. And so my uh, mentor, the teacher at the time, he was trying to uh, get, find me an optometry position as like an internship as a student. Mm -hmm. And he tried and tried and tried and couldn't get me then. He, he tried to he found something for me in Panasonic. And I was like, I mean, that's kind of cool to kind of work for Panasonic, but that's not really what I'm interested in. But all right, let's. But either way, he kept trying. And long story short, he was able to find an optometrist that was willing to take a student at that time. And so I shadowed uh, that optometrist my senior year. After I graduated high school, he liked my work ethic and he, he knew I wanted to be an optometrist. So he hired me uh, during the summer. And then I started Seton Hall University, which is a D1 uh, program. And um, I, I always loved sports. I, I actually did all intramurals there. I became an intramural athlete. I, I won many awards there in, in that space. Again, <laughs> what, I was better than What sports than did average. you play, though? So I baseball and basketball were my two main ones. Okay. Um, so I, I played better at baseball, but I liked basketball more. Mm -hmm. And so, again, to D1 school, I tried to walk onto the team, and that, that was too much of an ask. But uh, the <laughs> baseball coach actually found some liking into me and actually, actually asked me to be an uh, assistant student coach. And so that was nice of them to actually um, offer me that. And so I was able to you know, keep grinding. I did my undergrad in biology. I ended up after that doing my master's in microbiology. And so that's why I do a lot of talks on nutrition and health because the gut and the brain mm -hmm. are tied together and how it relates to the eyes. And so having that background, it's kind of funny how it came around full circle. I didn't think I would be talking about that in optometry, but I, I brought it back. And then obviously graduating from optometry school. I think, I mean, you, you touched on a lot of amazing things there. 
I think certainly in the last part, just in my own personal interest, I think the microbiology, the gut biome, we're finding so much more about that as research comes out. Uh, and, and it's relation to not just obviously nutrition, ocular nutrition, but it affects our whole body, inflammation, skin conditions, and then even dry eye to some degree. There's some, sure. I've, I've seen some publications kind of linking maybe those together. Yeah, without a doubt, hundred percent. So maybe we'll have to have you on for another, another podcast yeah, is talking great. about that. Sure, that'd be uh, awesome. So that, that's a whole other thing. Uh, I know, uh, beyond just optometry, cause I mean, I think sports is um, obviously a huge passion of yours has been a part of your life. It kind of helped to drive even your, your choices into college, like you mentioned. Now, from I know you have kind of a subspecialty in not just like vision therapy, but more sports vision. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think that's that's a cool thing, because in school, I mean, I went to school seven, eight years ago and you just sports vision isn't even part of the curriculum. It's something that's kind of mentioned, mm -hmm. you know, that maybe we had a sports vision club, but that was about as much as it is. So you can think about niches in eye care, right? Some mm -hmm. people are getting into dry eye, there's vision therapy, specialty contact lenses, but then sports vision is like one of those hyper niches, like, <laughs> yeah, it's true. You're right. So, um, just to talk a little bit more about that. Uh, I'd love to hear how you, how you really fell into that, how you got more education in that, mm -hmm. and then what you're doing with it now. Yeah, sure. So again, like I said, I wanted to be an optometrist, but the reason why I went to optometry in general was because of that sports vision niche. So when I was doing research, I saw that that was a division. And so uh, Seton Hall had a pre-optometry program, so that's why I chose Seton Hall to go to uh, for undergrad. And then um, I stood on to do my master's just because they offered me a TA position, and so um, they were paying me to go to school school and get a and on top of that make money so that was like that's a win-win situation and then I went to optometry so when I got to Pennsylvania College of Optometry which is now called Salus University uh, when I got there I noticed that there wasn't any sports division classes like you said there's no electives there wasn't even a club mm -hmm. so um, again being into sports uh, they had intramurals at my school and uh, the person at the time who was running the club, he actually gave me the position, he handed over me the position to run the program as a second year student. And the only thing that was offered there was basketball for boys. And so I introduced it to girls and then I brought in volleyball and other games like kickball and stuff like that. So I brought in the intramural space into mm -hmm. that school. And then after that, I actually started our first um, sports division club. So it was pretty much hands-on on myself to do all the learning. So pretty much what I would do is all I did was network as much as I could. So every time I was a student, I would go to all these conferences. I would go to AOA or I would go to Vision Expo and I would try to seek these people that knew anything about sports vision and mm -hmm. just pick their brains. And so I just kept doing that and doing that and doing that and showing up every time. And so I, I built a little bit of a network so they remembered me every time they saw me like, oh, you're like, this kid's actually being serious about this. Because some people are like, yeah, they want to do it, but they don't continuously show up. Yeah. And so that, I think that's one of the keys that I always I try to tell students is, number one, half the battle is just showing up. And, but the other thing is being passionate about whatever it is that you want to do, because passion is what's going to drive you to be successful in anything that you do. Because if you don't have passion behind you, then why bother? Yeah. And so uh, for me, it was seeking out um, those professionals that did it before me and then just reading books because that's you got to learn from people who've done it before. Otherwise, where are you going to get the information from? And so, so no one's teaching it in our school. It was just up to myself to try to do that. And uh now some schools are actually having them as electives and they might have a course in it, but not every school has that. Mm -hmm. So you were right on that. I think some of the big things that kind of just speaks to me hearing you talk about your, your kind of your path, your history, it's clear that you have both very serious leadership qualities in you. The fact that you started these different programs uh, and you sought this out yourself, you had this curious mind. I think those are just amazing things. Um, and so I respect and just appreciate that in you. So thank you for sharing that. I think, um, so you not only have this specialty and passion for sports, uh, certainly health, nutrition, microbiology, and then something else that you also have that a lot a lot of people i think walking around in eye care don't have is this financial literacy this mm -hmm. experience and and, and kind of how did you end up in that because that's one of the reasons that you and i even started talking was because you had this background in finance and you were able to kind of even give me kind of a refresher on like where i'm at mm -hmm. you know financially and i would just love to hear kind of how you even fell into that yeah for sure so Again, society always teaches us the traditional methods. What is it to do? Go to school, get good grades. Why? So that you can get a good job, right? And so we're 
we were high earners. We make good money because of the profession that we're in. So we were diligent enough to get to the field that we're in and we pass our boards and everything like that to make the money that we're making now, mm. right? But that's half of the equation. The other half of the equation is knowing how to be efficient with your money. Because if you're not efficient, then you're going to blow it. So, for example, you have all these high earners as athletes, right? And then you see in the news, all of a sudden they're broke and they're homeless mm. or they're on drugs or whatever the story may be. And it's because no one taught them how to actually manage the money appropriately. So when the pandemic hit, you notice that a lot of people, obviously there was no one working, right? So either people lost their jobs, people don't want to go back to work. So where are they getting this income from? And so we have to know how money works because we touch it all the time and, and we see it. We either borrow it, steal it, whatever it is that may happen, <laughs> right? But we don't really have like a game plan when it comes to money. So for example, I'm always relating everything back to sports. Why do people hire a sports trainer? For what reason? So they can look better and feel better, right? Why is it that when someone gets married, they have a, they hire a wedding planner for one day in their entire lives? But when it comes to money, right. they go on a 20, 30, 40 year journey with money, but they don't know a game plan or like a GPS, for example. So anyways, during the pandemic, to answer your question, I had a family friend of mine. He actually works in the financial space and he was able to, uh, to back me um, and said, hey, I can get you a um, professional license. And I was like, Personally, I, I don't care about finance because I'm a doctor and mm -hmm. sports and stuff. Like, I don't really care about finance. But now I'm just being stubborn because I need to know it at the end of the day because you need to know that sure. information, right? If, whether you're a business owner, whether it's for your family, for yourself, you got to know that information because yeah. if you don't, like, like I usually tell people that if you, don't, if you don't get a raise every year at your job, you're actually losing money every year. And the reason why is because of inflation. It's yeah. like that stealth tax. Absolutely. And historically, that's about 3%, right? I think the past four years is about 4%. And right now it's through the roof. It's like eight or nine. But normally it's three to 4%. So we need to know different ways of how to not only manage your money, but seek people that know the information to help you to win the game. That's really smart. And I think that's... Uh Gosh, I wish I wish I would have heard that <laughs> as early as like high school, maybe. For sure, yeah. Uh, and it's not taught in school because you know they, it's the sad truth of the traditional. They want us to be employees. The goal is to actually be a business owner. Not everybody's going to be a business owner. Not everybody has that passion or leadership positions, but that should be the ultimate end goal for everybody. Right. Now I think it's, uh, but it, it speaks a lot to just. Uh, polishing your skills, you know, you had the time. I don't know if you had the time in 2020, right? The, uh, because of the pandemic that was going on, but you, you had an opportunity and you saw the need for it. And you, you know, you, like you said, you're not maybe super passionate in it, but you pushed yourself to go through it. And now, mm -hmm. now you have this extra skill set that again, yeah. uh, I don't have. And I know a lot of other people in our, in our industry could probably wish they had. Yeah. So. And so the journey really is to show and educate our colleagues and the students of like, well, number one, what is the biggest pain points? You see it mm -hmm. all the time, whether it's on ODs on Facebook or any other platform, what are they, what are um, people posting on there? Should I even do optometry? They're mm -hmm. questioning it because of the impact of student loans, how much they're going to make after that. Is the profession going to be there after the pandemic, right? What other moves do I make? Right. So those questions are on people's minds. Right. And the, the highest I've seen so far personally, when it comes to undergrad, including, um, their optometry degree in student loans, like about 390,000 in debt. That's the highest I've seen wow. so far. Not everybody has that, but that's the highest ones that I've noticed so far, right? And so what happens is, is that most students, they get boggled down on that amount of debt. So what do they do? They go try to find that job that's the most highest earning possible job because they want to pay off their loans. They want to live that good life that they now just put in 25 years of their life, right? A quarter of their life spent in school. Now they want to enjoy that. And so they get kind of sucked in in a way or trapped, mm. you know, because they want to they either want to do a residency or they want to open up their own business or whatnot. But then I guess complacency kind of falls in a little bit because they get sure. comfortable in a spot that they might be in. And so they're like, all right, well, I'm here and I'm happy and I'm not going to continue to push. Right. You know, so it doesn't mean that happens to everybody, but I see it a lot. I know this kind of touches on that same topic, but I recently saw a post, uh, in one of the groups that's online in the world of finance and they were questioning the role of not just anybody but even doctors having these kind of side hustles you know they're trying to make ends meet sure. you know so i know myself in my own personal life i've kind of ended up carving out this these different paths of having new income streams mm -hmm. uh, and clearly with your line of work you're doing ce uh you're working in a clinic you've been working with another uh, program for children's vision and it, so you have all these different things going on uh 
just I, I would love to know your thoughts. One, your personal experience doing that. If if having additional income streams was a strategy for you specifically, but then do you think that's needed? Do you think that's something you would even recommend to other students, would be students, current doctors? What what are your thoughts on that? Sure. So again, it comes back to what I tell people all the time: is what is your why? What, what is your passion behind whatever it is that you're doing? Because if you don't have that, then it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. So what is the why to do residency? Why did you want to become an optometrist, right? And so why is it that you're working in that certain state? Is it because you moved because your husband or spouse is on the other side? Is that, you know, so you have to have all those questions aligned. And so we have to, um, number one, find out what it is that you want in life. But when it comes back to money standards, because success for everybody is different. It could be just having a loving home. It could be just being healthy. When it comes to money standards, uh, the people who are truly wealthy in this world have two, three, four, five different streams of income coming in at all times. So again, what does the schools teach us? Traditional route. The traditional route is to go to school, yep, get that job, get a job and, and, and become an employee. <laughs> right? But what happens is whenever you become an employee, you are playing the highest taxes than anybody else. Mm. Now, we are considered upper middle class because of the incomes that we make. And so what happens is we get taxed the most as an employee. And what happens is is that whatever the hours you work, 9 to 5, 10 to 6, whatever it is, you're pretty much, whatever your goal, whatever the goals and dreams are, you're making it for the owner of the practice. Yeah. It's their goals and dreams that you're, ma- you're pretty much making. So you're on a hamster wheel working that whatever the hours are. Right? Now, we enjoy what we do. It's a different story because we like optometry. But it's like we have golden handcuffs in a way, right? And so there's a, there's a good book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. And there's four quadrants, which is called the cash flow quadrant. Mm-hmm. And so he says that 95% of Americans, what do they do is they trade time for money. So what does that mean? You go to work, you get a paycheck. You go to work, you get a paycheck. Yep. If you continue to do that all your life, you're going to be continuously grinding. Again, you enjoy what you do. It's a different story, but you're still in those golden handcuffs. Mm-hmm. The next one is a self-employed. A lot of doctors that we know are self-employed. They're 1099 employees. They own, they, they own a business, but they're still on that, on that uh, 95% losing because they're still trading time for money. Because if they don't go to work, they can't afford the things that they want and all that stuff. The truly wealthy people when it comes um, for success financially is being a business owner, investing, meaning money's making you money, or the third thing, which is called passive or residual income, which is making money while you're sleeping. So a lot of doctors, sometimes they confuse the two because a lot of times, can, like say for myself, so I'm the head doctor at like, the company that I'm at. I'm at Optical Academy in New Jersey. And we actually work with the Education Association. So we see all those schools like you were mentioning before. And so what happens is, is that can I open up my own clinic and become my own doctor? Of course I could, right? Now I'm my own business owner. But what true business ownership really means is that you created a system for you and it runs whether you're there or not. So for example, if you're a solo doctor practice, and it's your practice, you own it, you're the business owner, right? But what happens when you own it, if you don't go to work, you can't make the full stream of income that you're making. In order for you to have a system in place, that means you hire other optometrists and they're doing the work and you're not there and you can be on vacation or with your family or doing whatever other things you wanna do and you can still bring in income. So for example, if you were to open up a McDonald's, is the owner of McDonald's ever there? Never. Never. (laughs) True business ownership means you have a system in place and it runs. Now, you could still be in the business if you want to because you enjoy that stuff. But Mm -hmm. we get tricked into the thing is like, well, now it's an identity crisis in a way because we did all this training to become an optometrist, not to run a business. Right. Because they don't teach us that stuff. Right. And so we feel like we have to be there for our patients, which that's true. Right. But again, it's our job is to delegate. And we're we're in the role of healthcare to provide to the masses to help them as much as possible. The more people that we can help, or the more offices you can open, the more people you're going to be able to assist. Right. Right. And now with AI and, and um, teleoptometry, there's, there's a lot of places, especially in the areas that I'm in, like major cities, there's a lot of these people that can't afford to go to get eye, eye care. And so just being able to care for those communities and, and being able to help them out is, is crucial. So, um, so knowing that cash flow quadrant is pre- should be helpful to to people, you know? And I think that's something that it's, it's definitely a process of learning that, uh, when I first even had that idea, kind of like you mentioned, Oh, as an owner, you can have the clinic still open. If you're not there, if you have another OD working, 
perhaps when I first heard about it, I heard it from a, a, a mentor who had a vision therapy practice. And he's like, well, I picked vision therapy because I can hire vision therapists to still see, see my patients and help them while I'm off uh, at CE or something like that. Yeah, right. And he still got cash flow going. And that, that was the first time I think I maybe was a, a first year student of optometry and it just, just blew my mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause you have to have the decision. So are you running the business or is the business running you? Mm -hmm. Right. And so you have to have that mindset because a lot of people are just locked in. They're constantly grinding at their job. They're making good income because it's their business. But now what are they trading now? Time away from their family, from their friends, other things that they could be doing. Maybe they like to go golf more. Mm -hmm. Maybe they wanted to come to this academy meeting, but they couldn't come because of work. Right. You know, so that's why I say golden handcuffs, because we want to do other things, but we can't because we got to go to work. So it's like we're trapped. Yeah. And especially with like the way student loans, like you mentioned, are now. You know, if you're going, if you're if you're exiting school with you know up to three hundred ninety thousand mm -hmm. dollars in debt, you have to be very committed to going to work, whether you like it or not. Yeah, sad truth. Yeah. So I know that was that was a tough thing for myself. Was when I finished school, I was very lucky. I had a little bit over than two hundred thousand in debt total between undergrad and my uh, optometry education, and after residency. I was just like, nope, I just need to start working. I need to pay this off. Mm -hmm. And I know that there's different there's different thoughts on, oh, interest rates. You know, should you pay off your student loans first? Should you be investing? Should you be maybe looking at, you know, buying mortgage? Should you be, you know, getting housing? There's different strategies out there. And I'm not a professional in that. Maybe you could talk on it. But I know for myself personally, dealing with the stress of that, that weight, those like, oh my gosh, I have this huge loan to pay off. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to get that done with as soon as possible. Sure. And so I pushed myself very hard. I was working five and a half, six days a week between different clinics, uh, just basically exchanging my time for money. And then at that same time, I would listen to podcasts and I would find out, oh, wait, there's there's people who have either websites or they write a book or there's some other ways to uh, generate income in different streams. And I think that my mind always kind of carried that. And so that's that's no doubt something I've... I've kind of learned and mastered over time, but even my own side of business, it's something that I've, I've always kept in the back of my head that maybe, maybe either owning a clinic or how do I turn my current business and start making it more work for me rather than having, <laughs> having it sure. run me. No, for sure. And so to answer the question with the debt side of things, so what happens is debt consolidators, you know, they see these incentives, sign up, we'll give you a thousand bucks. You think they're just giving you free money to give you free money? No, debt consolidators don't care about getting you out of debt. They just want you to shift your debt to them and you just pay them at a lower rate. Now, interest rates do matter, right? But nobody's taught anybody how to teach them how to get out of debt, mm. right? And so I'm able to help those people to do that because nobody cares to show them how to do that because the industry wants them to be in debt because it's massive money to debt consolidators mm -hmm. or just the industry in general, right? So if I was an investment advisor or a financial advisor or an investment advisor, what do you think my advice is going to be? You need to invest. Who cares about your debt? Sure. <laughs> right? Because they don't make any money on it. Why would they care about you getting out of debt if it makes you no money? So to answer your question, should I be minimizing my debt? Should I be investing? It's all of the above, but we got to find out, number one, what's the budget look like? How much cash flow or money that you have that you're able to uh, spend? Is it an extra $100 a day, $100 a week, $100? Whatever that amount is for that person, where do I allocate it to? Mm -hmm. Right? And so not everybody has that algorithm that I have to, able to show them strategically how to win the game. And so that's, that's, I guess, my calling is to try to help as many people as I can uh, with that information because that's what changed my life. Now, that reminds me of a famous quote from Warren Buffett, who, uh, you know, if people, Warren Buffett's this insanely rich investor, um, and he, he always would say something about that time is like the one most valuable thing that we have. Like we all have 24 hours in a day, mm -hmm. no matter how wealthy you are, no matter how many resources you are, you can't buy an extra hour in the day. Um, and the only way you can really do that is by um, kind of paying someone else to increase your speed into in something else. So you have to pay money to kind of hire someone else to buy yourself more time in a way. Yeah. It's about efficiency, coming back to the square mm -hmm. one where I said before, you're, you're dead on accurate. And to just carry back on the, on the time quote, like you said, 24 hours in a day, if you do that for the week, that's 168 hours, right? And so obviously we got to sleep. So let's say eight hours of sleep, 
We all work 40 hours a week, so that's 96 hours. Subtract that, you have 72 hours left to do with it. But you know, you gotta, if you have kids or you gotta pick them up from school or you gotta cook and clean, that kind of stuff, let's take another two hours or let's go another 20 hours with it. So let's say you have 50 hours left, right? So the most Americans, when I, come, when I talk to people like this, most Americans have between 40 to 50 hours of free time for themselves to do something else whether it's play basketball or go on a trip every time. Like outside of this work. Yeah, instead typical of the world 40 of a, hours of work week. Right, yeah. So a lot of people will say in their minds is that I don't have time. And we all have time. The only people who don't really have time are the single moms who have two, three, four jobs. They mm-hmm. don't have time. But all the other people have time. It's just where do they prioritize their time? So usually what I'll tell uh, somebody who I'm talking to is instead of saying I don't have time, reframe it and, says, and say, I don't prioritize that and see how that now it triggers into your brain, how that sounds. Yeah, that's huge. Right. And so if you'd like, oh, wait, because where do we spend our time on scrolling on Instagram oh. or YouTube or all that stuff? <laughs> I um, waste so much time. It's awful. We waste time. Right. Yeah. And we, we don't have time. It's just that we're not putting it in the proper place where we can actually have different streams of income. Now, it doesn't have to be for different streams of income, but it could be for anything else. Mm-hmm. It could just be um, deepening our minds to other things. Right. And so we learn from others. Right. And just to get, I think there's so much there's so much in life that you can't experience and want, and everybody's going to be different. And I think some people may just love working in the clinic, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Yeah, no. uh, part of my own heart is definitely I love seeing patients in the clinic, but I also have other interests in life. Sure, right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I think I would just love to hear your own, you yourself have only so much time. You're doing a lot with your but between work again ce you've you're doing finance stuff now like where what do you prioritize just to get to know you a little bit more like what's what are some of your true passions and what what are you prioritizing right now in your life yeah so um again it's now being a mentor to students about mm-hmm. what the whole finance thing showing them how to minimize their debt that's been a new passion of mine um, that i'm incorporating uh, because we all need to hear that conversation because if i were to ask these three questions to people i already know the answers to them would you want to retire earlier or later? Most people will say earlier. Would you want to have more or less money at retirement? Obviously more money. And would you want to have more or less debt? Less debt. So if I know the answers, is just to educate them, show them a game plan. Now it's up to them. The ball's in their court. Do you need help or not? Because most people are just going to wing it for themselves. Because there's so much information out there in the world. How do we know if we're getting good or bad information? How do we know that for sure? Right? And who's there guiding them? Right? And so, for example, if I were to screw over a colleague of mine, not only am I messing myself up in one space, now I'm messing myself up in another space, and now I'll be the villain. Mm-hmm. So I can't do that. I have to be genuine with that person and help them as much, as much as I can so that they can win the game, right? So going back to, like, what do I prioritize? So I know that what I'll say is networking is your net worth. So I knew that going into optometry school. From first day on from optometry school, I would go to all these conferences. I would volunteer at Special Olympics. I'd be the first one there, the last one to leave. Yeah. Right? And so I would continuously show up, show up, show up, because networking is your net worth. The more people that you know, the more people that they're going to be introduced you to and the more avenues or more doors that are going to open for yourself. Right? And again, it comes down to the passion of why. So most people, like, they'll study at school, and there's nothing wrong with it. We all got to study, right? But they don't go to these events. They don't seek other opportunities. And so what happens is now they're like, oh, well, I didn't do much, and I'm going to do a residency to broaden my skills on something. Right. And so that I have more access to people. So if you get on that early and you know that you'll be six more successful earlier on because everything compounds. Right. It's those things that people don't see in the shadows that you're doing. And then all the time it's like, Wait, where did this guy come from? Right. And now it's <laughs> like you see him everywhere. And so the, the goal is, is not just to be it's not to be wealthy. The goal is to enjoy the journey with other people, because how is it fun if you're like by you're you're the wealthy person, but everyone around you is losing. That's not right. Well, right. The team mindset, you want everybody to win together so that you're able to enjoy other things that you're doing. So I know that if I'm able to put in the, the time now, I can retire in five, 10 years. Right. And what am I going to do? Go to all the conferences and enjoy um, hanging out with people that I like to see. Right. And so it's not I'm not trapped anymore. Now it's I'm not working because I want I'm not working because I have to. I'm working because I want to. Mm-hmm. And so that's the difference because we like we all enjoy what we do. Right. So we're like, oh, I don't see myself retiring like just people when I talk to them. I don't see myself retiring until I'm 60 or 70. And that's great. Again, because we like what we do. But there's other optometrists who are you see them sometimes and they're like miserable and they're complaining. 
right? right. And it's just a different mindset. And, and then I think if, if somebody is trapped, right, if they're working so many hours, especially if it's something they're not super passionate about, because eventually, even if you, if even if it's something you love, if you love optometry, you love seeing patients in the clinic, if you work too many hours, you burn out, yeah. right? And then you're not happy. Yeah, so you got to recharge. And so that's the biggest key, because if you're able to do other things, it's going to make you enjoy going back to doing the stuff that you love to do, because things can get mundane right. after a while. So you got to switch it up at times, you know? And I think that's just the same going back to that point is that if you're if you are overworking, if you're unhappy where you're at, it's going to come through. It's going to end up bleeding into all yeah. the other people around you. Sure. It's and your true. patient care on top of that, too. Yeah, your your be. patients will know it. Yeah. And possible. I think I've been in that position at one point where I was working so much to pay off my loans. And even a patient stopped and asked me, like, are you OK? Like, are you are you feeling hmm. well? You look pale. Hmm. Like they, they even called that out and. I was just like, gosh, I've been grumpy. I'm not looking forward to work. I'm just daydreaming about being somewhere else and doing other things. So it, it is definitely, I think, a wake-up call there. Yeah. So. Yeah. And again, our job is to care for the masses. So we got to be at our tip-top shape whenever we're dealing with patient care because they're, they're, they need us. Right. Because if you're exhausted, if you're tired, you're not, you're not thinking your best. How are you going to make a critical decision about you know how yeah. to treat somebody if you're not if you're not in like if you're not at least eighty percent to a hundred percent there? Yeah, like sometimes present. we go on a robot mode. Sometimes you're just on automatic mode. Sometimes and you're mm-hmm. like, oh, you know, maybe I shouldn't have done that. You know, it can happen, especially if you're if you're I guess like you said, if you're overworked, you're doing too many hours, or if you're seeing too many patients mm-hmm. in a practice, that can also do it for you. So right now, what is kind of what's next for you? What do you, it sounds like obviously you're one of your biggest passions, the things that you care about is kind of this getting not just young students, but optometrists, because if you, I'd see the way I see it is you are, you've had these leadership qualities for a long time. You started all your intramural things. Now you're like expanding and you're basically kind of an, this reinforcer to our industry, especially these young ODs, uh, to be more financial literate themselves, come up with a game plan. But with that, you're almost solving our problems of feeling that those golden handcuffs. You're helping us unlock those because then we're going to be more passionate and more excited to help our patients and you end up helping even more people through that process. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm sorry. I feel like I just answered your question yeah, for no, you. <laughs> no, you did a good job. That's true, right? That's really the, that's the mindset I want to get people in is to enjoy the lives that they're, that they wanted, right? Yeah. And so um, it's just that debt causes majority of the stress, right? And then you see it all the time that usually financial troubles is what causes a divorce usually. But then yes and no, because you see all these people that are super rich and then, then they're getting divorced, mm-hmm. right? And so um, it's just the mindset and how you frame things. Yeah. And again, the two most important things is your passion and your why. If you can align those things, you're golden. You'll be happy for the rest of your life because it's not like you feel like you worked. You're enjoying those things that you're mm-hmm. doing, right? Kind of like you're doing this podcast. You enjoy doing podcasts. You like getting information out of people because it's going to share it to others so that they can change their lives. Right. So you're putting impact. So the world pays people into the value that it bring you bring to the world. Absolutely. That's the biggest thing, you know? And again, we don't want to trade time for money. The goal is to bring value. Bring value. Just want to kind of switch gears a little bit because, again, you have so much involved with, with sports, vision therapy, maybe not. not is, yeah. is, that, is that incorrect to call so, no, sports so, vision, well, vision therapy? Okay, so, um, so mm-hmm. sports and um, vision therapy, therapy do go hand in hand because they had tie in together. But there's sports-specific training that we can do. Um, so it's more of the eye-hand body coordination, right? Reaction timing and stuff of that nature. Usually vision therapy is like, okay, they had a concussion and now they got to get their eyes aligned again, right? Mm-hmm. So they, we need both of them together. So for me, the reason why I didn't do residency was because there is no sports vision residency. It's just vision therapy. Now for me, I'm like, vision therapy is very important. I think it's one of the best residencies to possibly do and I think it's the most needed um, because we're not taught as much in just regular optometry school. We, we get taught the basics, but we don't get that full exposure when we're there. I don't know if that's the same experience when you went to school. Well, our school had um, one class on vision therapy. It was one semester, and I'll give it to it. It is. It was very difficult. Our professor there, Dr. Maki, he was, I think, at least when I took his class, 
a lot of people were like, why is this so hard? And he, he expected us to know what we were talking about. He expected us to know his notes from the day before. Uh, and they, so I think I got a, for that one class, I got a really good education in it. The, the hard thing I think a lot of students carried was that they were like, we don't plan, some of them didn't plan to ever do vision therapy. Mm-hmm. So they're like, why am I in this? This is practically an elective but it's like one of the hardest courses they took. <laughs> yeah, no, you're right on that. So again, it comes back to like, what is the area of specialty that you like in optometry? Because there's some people who love contacts and then there's people who love low vision. And mm-hmm. one person loves another and the other one hates the other, right? So it's, it's hard, like you said. And, and vision therapy is one of those harder courses because you have to have all these numbers you got to remember. And then, you know, what's the alignment look like? And I then think, prism. I and, think there's a lot of complexity in right. it. There's just orthoptics in general or ferrometry. Uh, is is very complex. I think it's so complex because of just the neurological connection, your accommodation, your prescription, your refractive power. That that gets. I think there's a lot of mysteries in it, mm-hmm. and we probably just don't have good enough, probably published studies, mm-hmm. uh, which because I think is difficult to do. Sure. Uh, but I think that's that's could be one of the reasons why our general profession hasn't embraced it with all of its its love mm-hmm. um for how powerful it is yeah, I, I usually bow down to the to the vision therapists and the nora people because they they're top notch when it comes to that information and a lot of people are seeking that kind of care and they're not given that care because they don't know that number one it doesn't exist ophthalmology mm-hmm. or, or just plain medicine doesn't send it to for vision therapy and so it's really up to us at the end of the day to refer it out to that person right and so again i, I got more into the sports vision side of things yeah. but again there is like a a triangle or a hierarchy or a pyramid, let's just say, of, of what the sports vision realm looks like. So that foundation is that all optometrists can do sports vision because what do we do? We all do visual acuity. And so that's the foundation. Then we also do contrast sensitivity and depth perception. Those mm-hmm. are other levels of the box. Now the other one is like visual uh, perception or integration, um, the processing speed from the eye to the brain. And then the ultimate goal, the top level of the pyramid is pretty much the actually getting on the field with the actual athlete mm-hmm. right and so again most of these athletes are student athletes so if they'll perform in the classroom we hope they perform better in their games or vice versa and all that so my biggest goal was again going back to uh, undergrad when i went to seton hall i was after i graduated optometry school i went back to seton hall and i was like hey i'm an optometrist like i, I like sports vision like this is something that our athletes need and again i'm new i'm young they're like i have somebody already Hmm. And so out the door I go. I tried like twice in the first practice that I was at. So the first two years in practice, I worked at a private practice that actually saw the New York Giants. And so I left that practice and now I work at Optical Academy and I'm their sports vision director there. And so with us, we work with the Education Association and we go into the school districts in New Jersey and also New York City. And so I'm seeing the students. And who are the students attached to? Well, obviously the parents. And who are the parents attached to? The grandparents, right? So it builds that tripod method. And so since we work with the Education Association, so think of like the AOA for us, the educators have the NEA. And so they're, New Jersey is actually the largest in the country. Hmm. So we have the network, right? And so they will only work with us as a company. So now we just need the providers. And so those providers we are needed around the country because we want to attack the school systems because we already know that people who get a vision screening will not get an eye exam, right? And those numbers that you see all the time, that 25% need an actual prescription are dead on accurate. Yeah. And so we got to flood those school districts, especially because of the whole myopia management part of it Mm -hmm. right and so that's like one of my roles in optical academy but the other thing is now when i'm in the school systems who do i get to talk to all the coaches the athletic trainers the principals the nurses on the importance of number one getting an eye exam number two prescription eyewear whether it's contact sports goggles things like that because a lot of kids don't wear their glasses and if they're not wearing their glasses they're not going to wear it in their sport and now more injuries are happening because they can't react as soon right right so all those things tie in together but the ultimate goal really is versus two goals number one is to actually be like the sports vision doctor or the team doctor for Seton Hall. And the real ultimate goal, if I could ever get there, is to be the team doctor for the Yankees. Now, that could be dreaming, <laughs> right? But that's a goal of mine. That's an awesome yeah, right? I think you that's know? awesome. Yeah, about, let's do it. <laughs> right? yeah, so, how, how can I help? <laughs> right, yeah, exa- exactly. So I think Don, Donald Teague, uh, he's been a, a guru in our sports vision industry. And so I, if I'm not mistaken, I think he's still a consultant with the Yankees. Okay. Uh, so he's been doing it uh, for, for quite some time. But that is um, one, of, one of my goals. And, and Dr. Keith Smithson, he is a, a friend of mine, an optometrist, and he's the team doctor 
for the for all of Washington. So all of DC sports, mm-hmm. he's actually the team doc for them. So that is my like real goal. Right. And I think that's this whole idea of vision and eyes and sports because sports is such a big thing for kids. Like, right, they right. in communities, they try to get kids into sports just to be active, get yeah. off the couch. And then kids uh, still today aspire to, you know, famous basketball players, famous athletes, uh, football players. You know, they're kind of immortalized in many ways for their achievements, uh, for their work ethic. And that's definitely, certainly their pay, you know, how much they make. So I think a lot of people will think of that, but they don't know mm-hmm. that part of these professional athletes their training mm-hmm. is includes training their eyes. Yeah. Like people don't know the, that. Yeah. The last thing that they look at is their vision. So a coach, usually I'll tell the coach is, you know who the fastest player is, the stronger one, who has the best IQ, all that stuff, mm-hmm. right? Those metrics, they know it to the T. But when it comes to visual acuity, they have no idea. Right. <laughs> and so what I usually tell a coach or athletic trainer or whoever I'm speaking to or have the ability to speak to, I try to talk in their own language. So, for example, when they're training, a lot of them have to run around. Right. So they're usually running a race or track or whatever. And so I'll tell them, like, think of a race. And in a race, what happens? You always have your top three runners. Right. Let's pretend we're talking to the baseball coach. Sure. Let's say those top three runners are your 2010 vision. Right. Yeah. Everybody else who comes in the, in the big pack is 2015. Then you have someone just finally coming in. They're your 2020. And then the last few people are 2025. Right? And I give them that visual so that we can get an understanding. Be like, okay, I kind of get what you're saying now. Mm-hmm. And now we got to try to implement that. So it, going back to what I was saying before, those first two years, I struck out, struck out, struck out. I went back. I became a sports vision. I kept going. So it's about showing up mm-hmm. is the biggest thing. But <laughs> also, right, but also dedication. So what happens is the reason why in my opinion, or not my opinion, when you read books and just leadership or just in anything in life, is that people are afraid to fail because they don't want to be embarrassed of failing. Mm-hmm. But if you actually look at the definition of failure in the, in the dictionary, the actual definition for failure is it's the omission of expected action. The omission mm-hmm. of expected action. So that means to be successful is you need to do action. But you got to continue to do that. And so when you read a lot of these books, they say you want to double your rate of failure because the people who are truly successful is they found different ways to fail and then they get up and get back up and try to succeed. Right. Because you're not going to get it on the first try most of the time. If you did, then they were just lucky. Right. And all the successful people have gotten up and tried different methods. So the biggest thing you brought in Warren Buffett, let's go with Thomas Edison. What did he create? Um direct current light bulb exactly the light bulb right and so how many times did it take him to create the light bulb i think it was like a thousand times yeah. or something so his he his, failed qu- a thousand right. ways. his quote was that i i didn't fail ten thousand times i succeeded in finding ten thousand ways that didn't work right <laughs> so it's reframing the mind to saying i'm not giving up until this is succeed now the thing is that if you continuously do the same thing over and over and over again that definition is called insanity yeah, <laughs> I have heard that one somewhere. Uh, maybe it was just like, you know, one of the social media posts that floats by. Right. And so, again, if you can take that into perspective about the failures, the omission of expected action. It's because people are afraid to fail and people like to be in their comfort zone. Mm-hmm. And so if they go outside that box, they're like in open waters. And now what do they do? And if they get bitten, they're like, I got to get back on the boat. Right. But they don't go on that journey. And I think it was Robert Frost that says, go on the road that's the least taken. Yeah, I know that one. I don't know right. if it's Robert Frost. Yeah. Perhaps so, you're right. And so that my, 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 my goal or when I talk to people is that to be a leader, don't be a follower. Right. You know, and not everybody has those leadership roles. Some people have to be like pushed and say, hey, you got to go out there and do it. But once you get out there, it's just that you, you got to put in the work. And it'll come into flourishing if you can stay consistent with it. Right. It's it's there's so, it takes a lot of courage, I think, just to do a thousand something percent. Yes. to do anything new. Correct. Uh, even just being an optometry, choosing to go up to optometry school and know like, hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna fail a lot. Uh, you know, when it comes to not necessarily failure your class, but when it comes to seeing patients, you're going to forget things. It's going to take a long time. Uh, it takes a lot of hours and dedication of work to yes. get into it. And I think just the, that's when experience comes in when you are seeing patients or like you said, you went to, went back to the same people, the Seton Hall several times. Mm-hmm. Did you change 
Well, I would have to tre- to tweak you. it a little bit, you know. It's but it, again, it was just showing up, and mm-hmm. it's not that first, second, third handshake. It's the all right, this guy's back again, <laughs> you know. And so something's up, right? And so uh, again, like I'll try to use their language again when it comes to uh, for coaches, and let's pretend they're like, oh, but they have an eye doctor. Mm-hmm. So okay, so let so you just told me what I heard is that so they had a coach in high school, and they're gonna be like, you know what? I got to college, my high school coach, I'm going to utilize only my high school coach. I'm not going to listen to you. Mm. I see that. I see where that comes in. That's right. a good way to yeah. twist it. It's a twist. It's a reframing of the way you think, right? But like, no, I'm the new head person. Right. So it, now who's the new optometrist? The one that knows sports, not the regular person that doesn't know really much about sports vision. It's just the way you say, th- it's, it's the way you say things, not what you say. Or how you say it. But I kind of have, do have kind of the same thing, appreciation for marketing in that the way, the way we absorb knowledge from other people, the way we apply it to our own life. And that's how the psychology of marketing or just being able to speak to somebody or even just connect on their level. And I think that's a real skill that you've been able to kind of hit is like, hey, you're into sports and coaches think a certain way and you're able to give that comparison and change their mind. Otherwise they're just kind of brushing it off. Right. Like, oh, oh, this is just an eye doctor. They've got the right doctor. All eye doctors are the same. And it's like, oh no, 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 no. <laughs> like, like, just like you made the point that it's this, you know, if, you, if you're the coach now, you're telling, saying that they shouldn't listen to, you know, they, they should just be continue to listen to the coach that they had four years ago. Like it's totally different. They're mm-hmm. in a different league now. Right. And so I, I think it is something that even as our profession, we need to first speak to even people more like, hey, did you know that the eyes are that important that professional athletes go through specific eye training and even nutrition now is a thing with different sports athletes. They, they, they take like supplements or mm-hmm. uh, they have certain diet plans to enhance like their eyesight, their vision, because they're, they're going to really react faster. They're going to be able to see um, like the lines on a baseball because they can see how it's spinning midair. Like those are very high performance areas of just eyesight. Sure. So it's fascinating. Yeah, and that's the, that's the ultimate goal, really, like I said. So that's what I'm, it's a unique niche, and uh, it's a popular one. I mean, even though you don't see it much in when you go to either conferences, um, but people are looking for it, Yeah, you know. Is it, is it, because I have no idea, financially, you know, the riches are in the niches, if you've heard that phrase. Sure. What's like yeah. the financial oh, from, yeah. so for an eye of, clinic to specialize in sports vision? Yeah, for sure. So there's you could do basics, just contact lenses, sunglasses, like that could just be basic, right? Mm-hmm. Do you have prescription sunglasses? Do you have transitions in your glasses? Like those things matter. There's sports specific contact lenses with tints on them. Yeah, you know? I knew they make those. I think Nike had them at yeah, one point. That's right. Nike they, now there's a new brand coming out. Well, it came out. It's Altius. Altius. And it's a okay. daily contact lens. I'll have to look and, into that. Yeah, it's sports specific branded. So you could even do a, a YouTube on I will that have one. to. So, um, they'll, they'll love you for that one but um but it's pretty cool because it, it enhances the contrast so the seams get um, brighter the mm-hmm. greens and the green are better and all that stuff and so that's what we want to ultimately um help them and minimize glare on top of that sure. you know so like you said with nutraceuticals and all that stuff and so uh it's showing them those different outlets that they don't know that exists like mm-hmm. we said before and um but for the profit margins is now you have also different devices right so there's devices like right eye or neuro tracker mm. or let's say people will bring in um the uh I'm, i don't know why i'm blanking right now but the the fancy device that can prescribe prism and oh i don't know why i just blanked on it it, <laughs> it is a lot yeah it, it's uh well well you have to order the lenses specifically through a lab that they right, have yeah. the technology with it it is that yeah, it's the micro prism <laughs> Yeah. So, but anyways, going back to that. So just with the sports, so there's different um, devices that you can utilize and bring into practice. Um, but the biggest thing is that, again, is how you say things. So for example, parents are going to pay money for a kid to perform better in a sport. So they'll buy a fancier bat just so that they can hit better, but it's actually their vision that's hindering them from hitting the ball. Mm-hmm. Right. And so it's those things. So they have the money for it. So I'm usually when I do a lecture, I'll have a slide on, on profitability when it comes to sports vision. And so I'll put up the different leagues. So the NFL is a $13 billion league. It actually outperforms or beats the MLS, which is the number one sport in the whole world, mm. right? And so I usually tell the audience is that you're either playing a sport, watching a sport, or you're betting on it. You're doing one of those three things, right? And so sports is, is crucial in our world. They want 
parents are looking for like, well, how do they get their kids to get to an elite level? Or how do they get them to get a college scholarship? It's out there. It's just that nobody's showing them that. Or um, nobody knows those tools that are out there. Or, or it's hard because they don't see it in the media. And that's what makes the big disconnect. And so that's my job going to school districts to lay the foundation down to hopefully now we have this set in stone. Now the providers can come in and provide those things around the, the country. Right. Do you see a lot of uh, practitioners going into sports vision? Do you see that as a growing niche? I think what I've noticed is that a lot of people like it, but I don't see them going into it because what happens is once they go work at some place, they're not doing it. No one's offering it to them unless it's that actual specific person going to open up a new little avenue in their own clinic. But not that I've seen so far. Right. Uh, I think, I think personally, I, I have fascination with it. I'm not a huge sports guy myself, except for esports. Okay. Which I yeah, think, that's huge. That's another thing in gaming. Right, and that kind of falls into just eye strain and understanding, percent. you know, whether or not blue light or just dry eye. There's there's so much in there, sure. and it's still very much. It's been around, right? We've had screens since like the personal computers since the 1970s, but it's mm-hmm. it's it's part of our life. It's not going away. Yeah. But uh, perhaps they'll, they'll be more tied in with that, and that'll drum up even more attention. Without a doubt. So at Vision Expo West, uh, I think on that first day or second day of the conference, they actually that day came out with their actually gaming glasses. And it was from Oakley. Hmm. And so now there's actually tinted um, lenses for um, the screen. And so I'm sure that's going to be another thing that's going to be marketed heavily, obviously. So that came out. And so um, the NFL partnered with Oakley on their prism visors on the helmets of the athletes. And so those visors are now making the contrast better for them so that the field is a lot easier for them to see. So it picks up the ball better. Okay, Vito, this has been an amazing talk. Uh, just kind of fill us in on really what you're like most passionate about like just going forward, whether it's something you saw here at Academy where we're recording today or uh, just kind of going on to the next year. What are other avenues in optometry that you really care about? Sure. Yeah. So I love the view so far here at Academy in San Diego. So that's been nice so far on the first day. Uh, but I'm excited about what our future holds. So obviously, telemedicine into our world when the pandemic hit. So mm-hmm. I'm curious to see what AI technology is going to be in the future and just telemedicine in general. So uh, with the company that I'm at, Optical Academy, we have that platform to help yeah. help those remote areas. So we own all those um, website links and we own it. And so we're just waiting to see like what we're going to do through the pipelines. We, again, we need that um, connection with the other healthcare providers around the country. So that's what I, I, I perceive is going to be something crucial. I Again, think it is. I think you're absolutely right. The telemedicine is, is going, I don't think, I think, I think a lot of eye doctors don't realize that like for, we need to step up as an own telemedicine in eye care, because there's a lot of players out there who would love to pass it to somebody else and basically say, Oh, well, you don't need to see your doctor in the clinic. You can just go use an app or use the AI and where's the quality control? Where's the standard of care going? Who's making those decisions? So that it's gonna, it's going to play a bigger role, I think, than than people realize. Yeah. So I can't wait to see what it's in in store. So hopefully it doesn't replace us. You know, we always got to continue to level up. You know, that's mm-hmm. why there's specialties and everything like that. But we it's needed in our industry. And and uh, going back to gaming, that's huge because that's also a billion dollar industry. So. Um, we see students all the time, and are we asking them in, in the office, are, are you gaming? We're just assuming, or we're not asking those questions, and mm. that, what's that leading to? More dry eye problems. Yeah, definitely. Eye strain, dry eye, not sleeping well, yeah, not sleeping well. your circadian you. rhythm and all that stuff. Should we be in blue light all the time just versus sometimes? So those are biggest debates and controversies, and so mm-hmm. we got to get more more light on that topic, no pun intended. But <laughs> No, uh, definitely pun intended, yeah, right, yeah. absolutely. And so uh, we'll, we'll see what the future holds. I'm excited about it because uh, we got to continue to move the profession yeah. forward, obviously, and, and by learning as much as we can and doing the research and um, getting we're, the word out. We're going to be the experts in our community. We need to know these things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, We need to be educating and helping. Sure, without a doubt, a thousand percent. Well, Vito, then thank you so much for being here. Uh, huge honor and appreciate you. And I look forward to definitely getting you back on so we can talk more about the gut microbiome and uh, nutraceuticals and, and diet and how that affects the eyes and everything. Oh, so. that'd be awesome. So this was fun. I can't wait to do it next time. And uh, good luck uh, at the rest of the show. And uh, I hope you have a, a wider audience every time you, uh, you bring on someone new. So <laughs> That's the goal. It. So thank you. Uh, my pleasure, man. Take it easy.